on May 8th, prepare for that. And I have an announcement for that also, that children of all ages, their mothers, grandmothers, and even great-grandmothers are invited to sing together during the 10.30 a.m. worship service. We will gather at 9.50 to rehearse a song, He's Got the Whole World in His Hands, and then enjoy juice and donuts before singing together during worship. And then going on, um, we have graduation Sunday on May 15th and May 16th. Um, the CWF is going to meet at Chicago Speakeasy at 11.30 a.m. And then May 21st, the Men Fellowship are going to have a breakfast at 8.30 a.m. So if you take note of those. I'm going to open, um, I probably have done this before, but I love Psalms, and I picked Psalms 95, uh, verses 1 through 7. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us gather, give a joyous shout to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. Let us sing with praise, psalms of praise. For the Lord is great God, the great king above all gods. He owns the depths of the earth, and even the mightiest mountains are his. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. The hands form the dry land, too. Come, let us worship and, how, and, and bow down before him. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the sheep under his care. Would you pray with me? Almighty Father, we come as a church and individuals today seeking your Holy Spirit. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. Open our hearts and minds to feel your closeness and your love. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. First of all, I wanted to thank you for the, uh, the vacation days you uh, let us take this last week. We went over and enjoyed Omaha, and it's not very far, but there's a lot to see 
and there's a lot of good food, so we enjoyed ourselves immensely. Thursday morning driving back, though, we got up uh, quite early and left, and the fog was just terrible. And we inched along until we got to Avoca, Iowa, and then we pulled off and sat there for breakfast and uh, for, well, we didn't sit, sit at breakfast for two hours, but we also shopped in the Flying J. <laughs> but it was a good break, so thank you very, very much for that. We've got some folks we need to lift up in our prayers this week. I don't know if you're paying much attention to the craziness in Ukraine, but uh, please keep those people in your prayers. Peace would be good. And we forget about it a lot, but there are a lot of uh, countries around the world that seem to be uh, constantly at war with one another. So please, uh, peace is a wondrous thing, and we've taken it for granted here in the United States, but uh, we shouldn't. Um, Cheryl's got a family friend. Uh, their 40-year-old daughter died, so keep them in your prayers. Keep the families of Paul Barkley and Jake Benji upon their deaths in your prayers. And keep Mary Alice Orberg. She's in hospice care. We've got a variety of other people who need some uh, prayers. They'll be in the letter tomorrow. So please keep your prayers lifted up and stay actively involved. Would you join, your, uh, join me in prayer, please? Our loving Father, it is really fun to see the grass turning green and the trees bud and the flowers poking their, their stems up and you can even see some color now, some beautiful spring flowers. So here are thanks for that wonderful mystery that is nature, the seasons. I don't know how you figured it all out when you put things together, but it is indeed fascinating. So thank you very, very much for that gift. We'd like to thank you also for the gift you gave us of life, for the gift you gave us of our minds and bodies and hearts that carry us through and enable us to do so much, even if we abuse them with the kind of food we put in or not enough exercise or your creation of our bodies is amazing indeed. So here are thanks. We'd also like to thank you for those people who put up with us, those people who love us, often in spite of ourselves. Thank you for their patience. Thank you that they are determined to love us, even when we're difficult to love. And now, Lord, we present our leaders to you on national, state, local levels, and the world. Would you give them wisdom? Would you help them do what's right for the people? Would you be with them and be a guide? And lastly, we present ourselves to you. If we thought about it very much, I doubt that any of us would be able to call ourselves righteous, really good people this week, and we're far from perfect. So as we lift to you our sins, please, pray, uh, please forgive us. Please give us your mercy and your love. All we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. There's a scripture, kids. It's in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. It says, Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are our potter. We are the work of your hands. I bought these at the uh, Jocelyn Art Museum this week. Do you know what they are? They're little bendy men. You can make them bend any way you want. And when I saw them, it occurred to me that you and I are supposed to let God mold us. You and I are supposed to let God help us be the people we're supposed to be. God is the potter and we are the clay. God is the one who molds us and we're supposed to be flexible enough to allow God to mold us. So these little bendy men reminded me that they're a good example of God being able to mold us. Does your sister want one? You think she does? 
But what I want you guys to do is remember that we are supposed to let God, you're welcome, we are supposed to let God have an effect on the way we grow, on the kind of people we are. And that's what those little bendy men are supposed to remind you of. I miss any kids? I don't think so. It's a good chew toy? I guess that's a good reason as any. that um, C. Austin Miles, who wrote this song, it said that he was reading um, chapter 20 of the book of John. And after he read that story of Peter and John leaving the tomb and Mary staying there and then seeing her teacher and her friend and her Messiah, he was staring at a light blue wall and all of a sudden he had a vision, he was transported there and he felt that he was right there with Mary during that time. And so when he was done with that vision, he had all these words in his mind and he wrote down the words to this song in the garden. And I would ask you to sing it with me if you know it, and um, think of Mary in the garden, or better yet, think of yourself in the garden with your teacher and your master while we sing. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known I'd stay in the garden with him the night around me be falling but he bids me go through the voice of woe his voice to me is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known Thank you.
That's always been one of my uh, favorite songs. And I don't know if you've done a scriptural search to see what the Bible has to say about heavens, what heaven's like. I have quite often. Uh, when you do a lot of funerals, you have a tendency to look for, look for details. And that song for me, uh, sort of in a, a vaguer fashion, but a fashion that I love, that song for me uh, speaks of heaven in a way that really brings me comfort. It's the third verse. I'd stay in the garden with him. I think that's what heaven will be like. We'll get to stay in the garden with our Savior. We'll get to stay in this life. We're always having to, to leave the church, to leave the faith groups, to leave the Bible study, to go out into the world and practice what we preach. But in heaven, I don't think we'll ever have to leave his presence. And that, to me, is a wonder that makes me anticipate heaven in a real positive way. This follows in John chapter 20 after the, the, po the point of that song, but in chapter 20, verse 24, it reads like this. But Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. And he said, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them. And Jesus said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, but have yet come to believe. How do you decide what's true? I mean, are you familiar? You all do this. We all do this. We don't have a choice. We, we have to decide what we believe is true and what we believe is not. So think about how you go about deciding how do you decide what's true? How do you decide what's not true? For instance, if I were to offer you snacks, would you choose a carrot? <laughs> would you rather have a Hershey's bar? Well, now wait. As you know, our life is full of choices because you could have an apple. Apples are better than carrots. Huh. But there's also snicker bars. Well, that's what you like, Bill? Me too. And baby Ruth's. When I went to buy all this candy, I asked the lady checking me out, what would you, and she, put, she chose this one, so. There are also starbursts. Kids like starbursts. I can't eat them. They make my jaws ache. And there are oranges. So, if you had all of those snacks, which would you choose? How do you decide? Did you decide you, as you did because you want to live a healthy lifestyle? So you picked a carrot? Or did you once have a bad experience with a Hershey's chocolate bar so you wouldn't pick that? Or maybe you think that the combination of, of peanuts and caramel and chocolate and Snickers bars is about the best combination of flavors that humankind has ever invented. How did you just go through the process to decide which of those snacks you would take? Next, I want you to think about the Apostle Thomas. We know him as Doubting Thomas because he doubted. Most of the disciples saw the risen from the dead Savior, but Thomas wasn't there at that moment. So when Thomas famously said, unless I see the mark of nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in the side, I will not believe. If I told you that burning 85% ethanol would be a better choice than if you burn only 15%, ethanol or if you burn regular gas? 
If I chose to, if I told you that, would, would you start putting ethanol, 85% ethanol in your car? Is it because you don't believe me? Is it because you don't have enough information? You, you mean to tell me that if I told you that, you would not accept my expertise? You would doubt my credibility? You think I'm mistaken? Do you suspect that my conclusions might be wrong? Do you suppose that I'm not the best person to make that suggestion? Would you believe somebody if they, if they came into the room where you were and they said, John Wayne has risen from the grave and he's riding his horse down Park Avenue? Would you believe that person? Why or why not? You are like Thomas. You, me, we are doubting Thomas's. Like Thomas, you know what you know. And you know what is possible and you know what isn't possible. And you're going to trust your own conclusions and your own experiences far more than you're going to trust what somebody else has to say. But, but you got to wait a second. What about credibility? If an expert told you that it was going to rain every Sunday for a month, would you believe them? <laughs> Well, what if an expert weather person told you it was going to be sunny and warm just for the next four days? Would you believe them? No. You people are skeptical. <laughs> you are doubters. These people are highly trained. They are paid professionals. It's their job to know, and they have weather models from which to work. So why wouldn't you believe them? Is it because that they made a mistake last week? When Chevrolet tells you that they are the best and most highly awarded car, does it alter your plans to buy? When Consumer Reports says that it'd be best if you buy a Subaru or a Honda or a Toyota, do you, this is Consumer Reports by the way, does it change your pattern of buying? If I would have had time this morning, I would have gone in the parking lot and written down all the different cars you drive. I could see them from the door. It's about your own experiences. It's about what you've heard from people that you trust. It's about your own research and your own conclusions. It's about what you believe to be true. It's about what you know. Well, Thomas knew that Jesus was dead. And in the experience of Thomas, people who were dead generally stayed dead. I mean, there's, there is that Lazarus situation, but Jesus did that, and now Jesus is dead. Back in John eleven sixteen, 16, after Jesus told the disciples he was going to Jerusalem, Thomas said, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas had firsthand knowledge that the religious authorities in Jerusalem were planning to kill Jesus, and Jesus had told the disciples again and again that that's what's going to happen. So Thomas expected Jesus to die. And after the crucifixion of Jesus, Thomas heard it on good authority that Jesus died on the cross that day. He heard it on good authority that Jesus had been placed into a tomb, and it had been sealed. Jesus was dead and buried. So, after hearing about that situation again, can you blame Thomas for doubting the truth of what he heard? The other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Can you understand why Thomas doubted? Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in those marks and my hand in his side, I will not believe. How do you feel about people who doubt the Christian message? How do you feel about folks who don't believe in God? How do you feel about yourself when you yourself have doubts regarding something the Bible teaches as true? God made all of creation in seven days. God tore down the walls of Jericho after the Israelites marched around it. God gave the gift of speech to the donkey of the prophet Balaam. God closed the mouths of the lions in that den where they threw Daniel. Jesus walked on water. 
Jesus raised Lazarus from death. Jesus healed people who were blind and lame and ill, often with just a touch and a prayer. God promises to forgive people their sins if they repent and seek forgiveness. God promises to sit to forgive your sins as you forgive others. How do you feel about yourself when you doubt? When God doesn't seem to be listening to you, how do you feel? When people are just mean and it's hard to see any love in the world, how do you respond? How do you feel when bad things keep happening to good and innocent people? What do you do when you doubt? Thomas has more to teach us. First, Thomas refused to claim he understood if he didn't. He refused to claim he believed if he didn't believe. I think that first part might be something for us to consider if we want to grow in faith. We, we Christians have a tendency to spew how we understand and how we know, but we really don't understand it. We need more information. We need more research. We need more time. But Thomas refused to claim he understood if he didn't understand. You and I have a tendency to kind of toe the party line and say we understand even if we don't. Secondly, when Thomas was certain he fully committed to what he knew to be true. And that second part is a problem for us. Thomas fully committed. He said, my Lord and my God. And we Christians have a tendency to sort of edge our bets. We will agree. We will confess. We will be baptized. We will be active in a church. But we're, we're sort of edging around the corners of our doubts. We're sort of letting our lack of understanding become commonplace for us. And nobody's questioning us. Nobody's bugging about us. We don't have to take tests. But we also don't dig in and look deeper. You'll find many people who are positive, positive about which of our political candidates to vote for. Positive. Most of us, I guess, have never read history because so many of our candidates, they're one thing when they're getting elected and they're another thing when they're in office. Have you ever noticed that? But yet, when it's voting time, we act like we're positive and we'll do what we can to convince other people. How about you? Are you certain about stuff? Have you, like me, decided that golden retrievers are, are the best dogs? No question. Do you agree with me that Dr. Pepper is by far the best soft drink ever invented? You know it has, it has 43 flavors. Aren't you, aren't we right when we say that the NFL football is the best show on TV? And do you ever lift up your cell phone to somebody and tell them how good your coverage is? How good your company is? But oddly we're all in different companies. So we all have different opinions about it. We are certain. Are we? Are you? We know that Thomas had the courage of his convictions even to go to die with Jesus. We know that Thomas was a thoughtful person who gave serious consideration to what he held true. So he knew that Jesus was dead and he was right for three days. We know that Thomas wouldn't claim to believe something just because of peer pressure or conscience. He had to truly believe it before he said he believed it. And we know that Thomas doubted. And that's why we call him Doubting Thomas. But look at John 20, 28. When Jesus proved his resurrected life to Thomas, when Thomas was confronted with a new and miraculous reality that Jesus lived, Thomas responded, my Lord and my God. Thomas knew, he, he believed, he committed to Jesus. All right, now it's time for you and me. John 20, 29. Jesus said to Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? 
Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have come to believe. You know who that is? That's you. People who have not seen Jesus in the flesh but have still come to believe. Our Savior needs people to believe. He needs people to live in the, in the best, most righteous way they can. He needs people to, to share the fact that they believe with other people. He needs people to share the message. He needs people to tell others. But you and I, we sort of evaluate our own faith and we decide we're not worthy. We shouldn't be telling anybody else because our faith is incomplete. Our faith is marginal. Our faith includes doubts. Our faith is not solid and secure. At the end of Matthew's Gospel is a fascinating verse about the time the disciples were gathered with Jesus after his resurrection. And prior to the ascension of Jesus into heaven, Matthew 28, 17 reads like this. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Isn't that us? Isn't that you and me? We worship, we worship him, even though we have doubts. Belief, in my opinion, is strengthened through questions. If the person asking the questions will seek the answer. If you have a doubt or a question, I believe your faith will be stronger if you seek the answer to your question. If you research your doubt, I think the end result will be for you to have a stronger faith. So that's the task I give you from the Apostle Thomas, from doubting Thomas. It's not a problem with your doubt. It's a problem if you don't let your doubt and your questions lead you on a search for the answers. I have absolute confidence in the Bible. If you get into the Bible and you search a response to your doubt or an answer to your question, you will find it and your faith will be stronger. Amen. On our first day in Omaha, we were looking for a restaurant and Mary Kay, my wife, had done some research and on the research was Jim and Jenny's Greek Village Restaurant. Jim and Jenny's Greek Village Restaurant. Well, how could we not go there? <laughs> so we went there and uh, ordered some stuff. Mary Kay's was lamb. And it was cooked very, very well. Most lamb I've had is overcooked, so it's not much taste. This was very, very good. I ordered something I didn't know what it was, and I didn't know how to pronounce it. But when it came, it was real similar to the Hungarian goulash my mom used to fix. You all know Hungarian goulash? So it was quite a bit like that. But then they served a bread, and the bread was so good, they could have skipped everything else. <laughs> The meals that we uh, stumble upon sometimes are a surprise to us. And, uh, off, and sometimes, we, sometimes we, we were talking about Jimmy John's this morning and how they're, uh, I've enjoyed my, my meals with them, but for almost every restaurant, sometimes I'm really pleased and sometimes I'm not. Do you know what makes this meal come alive, you know what makes this meal worthwhile? You know what makes this meal really, really good? It's not, it's not the juice and the bread. Those are just symbols to remind us of Jesus Christ's body and blood. But what makes it really special is what, what I bring to the table, what you bring to the table. In our minds and our hearts, if we are ready, then these little emblems can remind us so, so deeply of the love of Jesus for us that the meal is wonderful. And if we're not ready, it'll be juice and a little pink piece of bread. You get a pick. You get a pick 
whether you get your head and your heart ready to accept what this, what we're remembering, or you can start thinking about other stuff, and it'll be nothing for you other than a little cup of juice and a piece of bread. You get to choose, but you are invited to the table to remember the gift of Jesus Christ. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Will you pray with me, please? Creator God, when we come to this table today and take of this bread, we feel your self-sacrificing love for us, your children. Also, let us be reminded that this cup we now lift up for your blessing is a sign of your compassion and for it reminds us that the life blood of Jesus was poured out for us. We worship at Christ who has risen and gives us the power of eternal life. Help us to be faithful as you were faithful. Let the moment of communion anchor our lives to your unchanging love as we repeat the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven,
This is the time of service that we have the call to offering. Before I do that, though, I'd like to apologize to Kirk Johnson. I forgot his announcement. I even used his, his pen to write it down and still forgot it, but I'll give it to you now. Um, there's going to be a work retreat. Uh, he said all skill levels um, this Friday and Saturday at the Newton uh, Church Camp. Uh, and supposedly we'll meet around 9 o'clock at the lodge if any of you are interested or have the time off. For communion, I like to read uh, from Psalms 96, uh, 1 through 8. Sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things that he has done. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He is reverend above all other gods. The gods of other nations are merely idols, for the God made the heavens. Honor and majesty surround him. Strength and beauty are his sanctuary. O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come to worship him. If you have an uh, offering here today, you can put it in the back. There's a collection plate at home. You may send it in to the church office and it will be tabulated. For now, would you pray with me? Gracious God, you pour out blessings upon us and cover us with grace. Accept these tithes and offerings that you may bring blessings to those in need and give witness to your overwhelming love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many of you, uh, by show of hands, have preached a sermon? So there's quite a few of you. Well, question for you. Were you ready? I've been doing this almost every week since 1976. I'm never ready. You know how you know I'm not ready? I can do like I did this morning. I can pull the sermon out just before Linda and her musicians or the search can be people start coming into church when things are nice and quiet and I'll read through this and I'll say, oh, that's not right. And I, I get my red pen out and I start doing this. And it doesn't matter how many times do it, I do it during the week. Every time I can find things that I didn't say that well. Well, that's not right. That doesn't sound good. I can't even pronounce that word now. Every time. Every time. Or like a funeral I had yesterday. I mean, when you do a funeral, you're, you're trying to consolidate a person's life into 10 or 15 minutes. It's impossible. So there's no way to be ready. The only way you're ready is they, they tell you it's time to get up and talk. Do you know what makes the difference? It's asking in the Spirit of God. Asking the Spirit of God to be with you while you're preaching or speaking. I think it holds for almost everything. Asking in the Spirit of God. And if you do that, then uh, each time you present or each time you do whatever task you have to do, the Lord is with you. But most of us, most of the time, get so involved in what we're doing that we don't really pay attention. It doesn't usually strike me until I'm on my way home that uh, I had help. I couldn't have done that by myself. So the Lord will respond if you ask. The invitation to people to join the church is the same. We invite people to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and give their confession of faith when the Lord moves them to do so. In order for that to happen, you need to pray to the Lord prior to and after. At this moment in time, we'd like to invite any who need to give their life to Christ to come forward as we sing this song. Will you stand with me?
days to come, may the Lord bless you. And more than that, might you open your eyes and your hearts and your brains and watch for the Lord's blessings. And when they come, give him thanks. May the Lord bless you and keep you strong in faith. May the Lord be with you wherever you have to walk this week. May the Lord let you know that he is paying attention to you and all you have to do is pay attention for him. And may he give you peace. Amen.